God's word alone, where his perfect will is known. Our traditions shift like sand, while his truth forever stands. We will live by faith alone, clothed in merit, not our own. All we claim is Jesus Christ and His finished sacrifice. Glory be, glory be to God alone. Through the church He redeemed and made His own. He has freed us, He will keep us till we're safely home. Glory be, glory be to God alone. Post Tenebras Lux. After darkness, light, and solely Deo Gloria. Well, I see some of you are excited for tonight. Someone said, I'm not going to miss this one. <laughs> Sandra said, making sure I'm here for this one. Perhaps Sandra is anticipating the fireworks that always follow these sorts of things. Ah. <laughs> uh, you know, and it, it just occurred to me, got to say, uh, so Nate here, every time he comes, he says, gift of God has arrived. And I'm so slow. I don't know why it didn't occur to me before, but, <laughs> but his name in Hebrew, Nathan, means gift, right? So <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, Nate. Uh, I'll try and be try and be quicker in the future. Good to see you. Beginning of Wisdom, by the way, uh, Beginning of Wisdom has a good channel. If you guys are looking for another channel to check out and potentially subscribe to and add to the things you watch, uh, there's some good stuff over there. Uh, good to see you, Roman. And good to see that one of my mods is here. Good to see you, John. By the way, John, I don't know if you are the John who sent me a book recently, but there was a John A. who sent me a, a book, and for it, I am very thankful. It's called Old Testament Use of Old Testament. I don't know why it doesn't say the Old Testament use of the Old Testament. I guess a reason might be because it's not that the Old Testament as a whole is using some other thing called the Old Testament, but that books within the Old Testament are citing, picking up on, echoing or alluding to prior Old Testament books. So maybe that's why it just seems like an awkward sort of title, but by no means, by no means a small, insignificant matter. In fact, one of the principles that the Reformation recovered that was believed by the early fathers, even though the Romanists and the Eastern Orthodox hate to hear it, is the principle that the sole infallible interpreter of Scripture is Scripture itself. Well, one of the basis for believing that, in fact, a primary basis for believing that, is that this is what we see happening in Scripture itself. Scripture interprets Scripture. Later scripture often harkens back to or picks up on, or in one way or another, uh, there's this interplay going on between texts that illuminate. They're, they're mutually illuminating. And so this book is one I've been looking forward to get uh, getting. And I have a number of books on, usually when you when you're talking about something, with respect to one thing interpreting another, it's usually the New Testament being viewed as that which interprets the Old. And that's true. The, the New Testament comes along 
and interprets the old. It's what gives rise to those common sayings, uh, the old or the new is in the old contained, the old is in the new explained, or the new is in the old concealed, the old is in the new revealed. Uh, that's the basic logic, uh, but it's usually focused on the New Testament illuminating the old. But this this book is actually doing something that you've heard me talk about. Usually I use the term intertextuality, where I'm just referring to the idea that there are certain ways that the Old Testament writers will tip you off to the fact that they have some prior text in view and so this text is to be read along with that text in one way or another. And just, just to give a quick example, if you've been around for a while, you've heard me give this example. But in Genesis 1-2, it doesn't always have to be prophecy, by the way. Uh, but in Genesis 1-2, it speaks of the Spirit of God brooding over the surface of the waters. And in fact, the, the whole verse says uh, that there was... The earth was without form and void, tohu vavohu. Uh, and, and that language comes up again after God delivers Israel from the sea. In fact, many years later, but there's a song at the end of the Torah in Deuteronomy 32 that was intended to serve as a reminder to Israel in the latter days of what God had done for them. And this song would then serve as a witness against them, a warning to them uh, uh, not to apostatize from the Lord. And so one of the things the song does is it looks back to God's blessings to Israel, principally his delivery of the people from Egypt. And in the course of that, it speaks of God hovering over the people of Israel and protecting and caring for them. Now, in that same context, it speaks of God finding Israel in a, in a barren land, in a wasteless void, and rescuing her and delivering her through the water. Now, already, just conceptually, you can see that there's something similar going on here. When God created the world, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the... Uh, the Spirit of God was brooding over the surface of the waters. The, the earth is portrayed as submerged in water, and then God, through a series of successive fiats, causes the waters to part or recede and the dry land to appear. And so the dry land emerges, and then eventually God creates man. And so what's happening at the Exodus is God is doing something similar. He's causing a new creation, in a sense. He is delivering Israel from Egypt, parting the waters of the Red Sea, causing Israel to cross over on dry ground. And then God is portrayed doing to Israel what the Spirit of God is portrayed doing at the beginning. And so you get this picture of recreation or new creation. So that's uh, the sort of thing that's addressed in a book like this. And as you can see, it's pretty thick. So this is about well, I turn to the appendix. I'm not at the end, and it's like a thousand, a thousand pages plus. So, thank you, John A, for this. It will come in handy, and it will eventually be a blessing to all of you. Now, since I mentioned sola scriptura, <laughs> I I can't help. So I've been reading this. This is a collection of creedal confessional catechetical standards produced by the Eastern Church, the allegedly infallible Eastern Church, the allegedly absolutely unified Eastern Church, which is ever so divided. Uh, but anyways, the, there's a section in here, and by the way, as an aside, this, this collection was done by Joshua Shooping. Joshua Shooping used to be Eastern Orthodox, but no longer is. He's a, a Protestant now. But in any case, these are still the, these are still standards recognized by the Eastern Church. And there's a section in something that's sometimes called the Confession of Docetius. Uh, other times, it's called the Synod of 
uh, Jerusalem, uh, but it comes from the Acts and Decrees of the Synod of Jerusalem, which occurred in 1672. So at the end, it has a series of decrees, and then at the end, it has a series of questions, really just four, four main questions. And th that's just, again, that's just one of the things that's found in here, but uh, it has a series of questions, and, and here's one that uh, is noteworthy. I mean, there's all sorts of stuff that's noteworthy in here, but here's the question. Should the divine scriptures be read in the vulgar tongue by all Christians? Okay, let me disambiguate that. I don't think most of us are used to using the phrase vulgar. Vulgar tends to mean something like swear words, but here it means the common language. It's asking, should Christians read the Bible for themselves in their own language? Now, this question was a hot one during the time of the Reformation. It, uh, the, the Roman church was not happy that Luther and others were translating the scriptures into the common language. They believed that this was dangerous. Now, why would a church that thinks the Bible supports their teachings believe that it was dangerous for people to have the scriptures? Now, of course, there are people that will misuse things, just like there are people that misuse guns, people that misuse uh, medications, people misuse all sorts of things. Uh, but uh, those who believe they are in themselves good and there's a proper use are usually more inclined to teaching them so that they're not misused. And in any case, uh, we know how Rome answered the question. Rome did not want everybody to read the Bible for themselves in their own language. So here's the question again. Should the divine scriptures be read in the vulgar tongue by all Christians? And here's the first sentence. No, period. No, period. Should the divine scriptures be read in the vulgar tongue by all Christians? No. For that all scripture is divinely inspired and profitable, we know, and is of such necessity that without the same, it's impossible to be orthodox at all. They have to admit that sort of thing, right? So they're saying, yes, the, the scriptures are inspired of God and they're profitable. Nevertheless, they should not be read by all, but only by those who, one, with fitting research, have inquired into the deep things of the Spirit. So how does one not read the scriptures but then prove themselves to be fitting to do so by inquiring into the deep things of the Spirit, right? You're, you're supposed to do that apart from Scripture, according to this. You're fitting, you're able to read the Scriptures. Everybody isn't supposed to read the Scriptures, but you can. It's fitting in the case of those who have inquired into the deep things of the Spirit outside of the Spirit's Word, okay? That's what they're telling you. And to who know in what manner the divine scriptures ought to be searched and taught and finally read. Okay, So you first have to know how the divine scriptures are to be searched, taught, and read. And who, of course, is going to tell you that? Well, it's going to be the same people that are supposedly going to give you the deep things of the Spirit that you can't get from the Spirit's Word. And then it goes on, to those who are not so disciplined or who cannot distinguish or who understand the Bible only literally or in any other way contrary to orthodoxy, what is contained in the scriptures, the universal church, as knowing by experience the mischief arising therefrom, forbids the reading of the same. So the scriptures reading them is a source of mischief. You should not read the scriptures unless you first learn from them the deep things of the Spirit and how you're supposed to interpret the Bible. Right? Otherwise, you're not going to get the deep things of the Spirit, and you're going to come up with doctrines that are meddlesome to the teachings of orthodoxy. It goes on, it is permitted to every orthodox to hear indeed the scriptures. So when we read them to you, in are out of their context, which is usually what happens in a lot of these 
liturgies and so forth of some of these churches, people don't know the context of the things they're hearing. And then they're surrounded by new contexts that are supplied by these liturgical forms. But in any case, it says, it is permitted to every Orthodox to hear indeed the scriptures, that he may, he may believe with the heart unto, unto righteousness, but to read some parts of the scriptures, and especially the Old Testament, is forbidden for the aforesaid reasons and others of the like sort. For it is the same thing thus to prohibit undisciplined persons from reading all the sacred scriptures as to require infants to abstain from strong meats. <laughs> ah, well, that doesn't tell you a lot. If that doesn't tell you a lot. <laughs> all right, I saw there was a question. It looks like Sam is already anticipating our discussion to some degree. Sam asks, how can Mary be sinless? If Jesus said there is none greater born of women than John the Baptist, and he's a sinner, he doubted Christ. Uh, uh, I think you're referring to his messiahship or his uh, godhood. So one thing I'd say first with respect to John the Baptist John, even though raised up by God as a prophet and sent to do exactly what he did, to speak the words that he spoke, to point to the Messiah, to baptize people, prepare the way, call them to repentance and so forth. That doesn't mean that John had everything figured out. And like many of his contemporaries may well have wondered exactly how certain things were going to eventuate and how they were going to pan out. And so when John is cast into prison and He's hearing that Jesus is doing certain things, but also that the authorities are not believing in him and, in fact, are denouncing him and want him just like they want John. John, in that context, wants to know, he wants to have his faith confirmed that Jesus is the promised one. And so what does Jesus do? He tells the, the people that came to him to go back to John and tell them, tell him what's happening. The, the dead are being raised to life, the sick are being healed, the kingdom of God is being preached, and so forth. And so that was supposed to alleviate John's concerns. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so the question about Mary's sinlessness with respect to John. Now, one thing is that Jesus is talking about the old covenant order so john is if you will the end of that uh old covenant system he he was the last to be sent in you know prior to the inauguration of the new covenant and so i think some people would simply say yeah with respect to uh that you know john is is the greatest because john and this is what really causes him to stand out while all the prophets of the Old Covenant pointed forward to Jesus, they were all looking into the future. They were all looking at a distance. But John had the great and inestimable privilege of saying, here he is. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He saw Jesus with his own eyes, and he testified that this is the one on whom the Spirit came to rest. And so John was privileged above them all. And so I think that a Roman Catholic might say, well... That's quite irrelevant to the status of Mary. She gave birth to Jesus. Now, I don't think that goes the distance of proving that she's sinless. She doesn't have to be sinless in order for Jesus to be sinless. That's the whole point of the virgin birth. It's the virgin birth that protects Christ from contracting sin, right? From uh, his, it's, he's not a product of ordinary generation. It's not that a husband and woman got together, or a wife got together and copulated, and through that process that sin normally transmits through, it's not as if he came into the world in that way. Rather, the Spirit bypassed the agency of a man, sanctified Mary's womb, and caused her to conceive Christ. And so he was born holy, without uh, any corruption. But this also shows that there's no need for the Roman fiction of Mary's immaculate conception. She does not have to have been immaculately conceived in order for Jesus to be sinless. 
Otherwise, you have to say that her mother was immaculately conceived and her mother was immaculately conceived. If you don't have to say that, well, then Mary didn't have to be immaculately conceived in order for Christ to have been sinless. So hopefully that uh, helps. Uh, <laughs> John A. says, it's the spirit, the Orthodox Church. <laughs> yeah, you'd think uh, they certainly... Uh, well, it's just like the, you know, the, the whole claim of the Pope to be the vicar of Christ in Alter Christus. He's the visible head of Christ Church, substituting in Christ's absence. But isn't that what Christ said the Spirit was going to do? Christ said that he's ascending into heaven, but don't worry, I won't leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And he meant by means of the Spirit. He sent his Spirit into the world to serve as another helper, right? A, another uh, advocate. And so the Pope is usurping the place of the Spirit. Uh, actually, so what did your comment? I didn't read the comment. So simply reading them is problematic, even though the Bible says to study the word over and over again. Exactly, exactly. Now, and, and this gets into another issue. I mean, one other issue is the, the issue of perspicuity. It's not only that Scripture is the sole infallible norm, but that Scripture is perspicuous. And so while it's true that some parts of Scripture are harder than others, not everything is equally hard, and nothing is so hard that it's impossible to be understood with, with labor. And so there's going to be all sorts of things that everybody can easily understand. I'm talking about you know people that have the ability to think and reason and so forth. They're not mentally impaired. Uh, and, you know, but it's by means of reading the scriptures, though, that you gain further knowledge and the parts that might have been obscure to you before become more clear. Uh, in the Psalms, it says the unfolding of your word gives light, right? The more and more we search through the scriptures, the greater the light that we have. Psalm 119, 105 says your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. These people act like scripture is darkness. And those who read it are bound to stumble into error, whereas Scripture was given precisely so that people would not stumble along in the dark. It is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. H how do you have entire psalms about the Word of God and its purity and blessedness and so forth uh, if this sort of thing is true, the, the sorts of things these guys are saying? Look at Psalm 119. Uh, seven all the way to the end. Uh, look at, uh, or excuse me, I meant Psalm 19, verse seven all the way to the end, and then also the entirety of Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the Bible, all about the beauty and the perfection of God's word. All right. Anyways, all that by way of intro, let's get into our topic. So we're looking at Galatians 119 today. For the sake of context, I'm going to go back to verse 13, and we're going to read the text, and then get into it. So again, our focus is verse 19, starting in verse 13, for you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and try to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. But when God, who had set me apart even from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me, so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. Then, three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him fifteen days. But I did not see any other of the apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now in what I'm writing to you, I assure you before God that I am not lying. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea, which are in Christ. 
And thus ends the reading of God's inspired and life-giving and light-giving word. All right, so as I said, verse 19 is the text that we're focusing on now. And in context, the point that Paul is driving at is that his authority and the gospel that he proclaimed was not something that he got from other men, and it wasn't something that other men were the originators of. Rather, the gospel originates with Christ, and it was communicated to him immediately. That is, there were no intervening individuals between Christ and Paul that account for Paul uh, having this gospel and going about to proclaim it. Paul was directly called by Jesus Christ and was sent into the world with this gospel. And so for that reason, Paul labors to show that he did not get this gospel from anybody else, not even the apostles or Peter. He'll make even more of this in the next chapter, but here so far he's, he's already said that he didn't immediately go and consult with flesh and blood. He didn't run up to Jerusalem to find out what the gospel is or to have his papers stamped by them. Rather, he went away to Arabia and he did other things before finally going up to Jerusalem after three years. So again, no urgency on Paul's part. After three years of feverish activity in the cause of Christ, Paul was laboring in the gospel during those years. And then he went up to Jerusalem, and, and not, not to become Peter's disciple or to learn or shore up the inadequacies in his understanding. No, he went up there simply to become acquainted with Cephas. The word that's used there is a term that simply means to become familiar with. He went up to become acquainted with Peter. And he only stayed with him for 15 days, hardly sufficient to uh, become somebody's disciple. And then he goes on to, to say, as, as if it were an aside, but I did not see any other of the apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Well, who is James? Now, uh, today... This is actually going to be a part one of, of two. What I want to do today is not so much solve the question whether Mary remained a virgin. That's not even Paul's point here, right? Paul's point here is simply to say that he didn't see anybody else except for James, right? So the main point, the focus is that he didn't get his gospel from anybody else, and his level of involvement with people of note, people of you know notoriety, these pillars in the church, these styloi, uh, you know, there, there was really nothing to talk about. He spent 15 days with Peter and and briefly came into contact with James. So he's he's not trying to focus on the question: Did Mary remain a virgin or anything like that? That doesn't mean that this is not relevant to that question, though. But, but the question I want to ask today, with respect to the perpetual virginity of Mary, is whether the New Testament is at all interested in communicating this idea. And along with that, the issue, is this question a matter of salvific significance? Now, I'm asking these questions for a deliberate reason, and you'll see why in, in a moment. But, but first, we got to take a little bit of an excursus. Okay? we got to take a little bit of an excursus. It'll seem like it has nothing to do with this topic. And some of you have gotten used to me by now. You know I do this sort of thing where I, I seem to be going way off the beaten track. But then I come back around, and, and you eventually see what, what it was all about. Well, one thing before moving on is just to note that there are numerous people by the name of James in the New Testament, or really uh, Jacob. Uh, numerous people, for example, you have 
James, the brother of John, the sons of Zebedee, otherwise known as Boanerges, the sons of thunder. You have James, the son of Alphaeus, who, another apostle, by the way. So two apostles were named James. James, the brother of John, the sons of uh, Zebedee. And then James, the son of Alphaeus. Then you're also told in, and we'll see some of these passages in a, in a bit, of the brothers and sisters of Christ in passages like Mark 3 and, and Mark 6. And one of the brothers is named James. So you have various Jameses and perhaps more. Uh, we'll see in a, in a uh, if not today, then next time, how many Jameses there potentially are. Uh, but one thing that should be evident here is that this statement, the Lord's brother, is intended precisely to disambiguate where there is potential for ambiguity. Because there are numerous people named James, it's necessary to disambiguate who you mean when you use that term. That's, that's the point of the, the latter statement, the Lord's brother. This phrase is distinguishing him from other people by the name of James. All right, now let's go on our little excursus here. This is Lewis Burkhoff's Systematic Theology. This is one of the first books I ever read as a Christian, and really like only the third or fourth book I read in my life. <laughs> told you guys before that up until I was 18, I had only read two books, James and the Giant Peach and The Call of the Wild. Both were required reading in school, so I had to read those. And the rest of the time, I just cheated because I, I, uh, I was just bad as a kid. But uh, anyway, so by the time I was 18, I had only read two books in my life. But in, at the age of 18, 19, I was converted and suddenly had a love for reading. And this is one of the books that was put in my hands, one of five books. So Lewis Burkhoff is a very standard systematic theology. Uh, there are many systematic theologies. You have the systematic theology of Charles Hodge, uh, the systematic theology of Robert Raymond. Uh, numerous systematic theologies abound, right? Especially since the time of the Reformation. The Reformation is really when you have the beginning of people writing systematic theologies. Now, it's not to say that you don't get anything uh, prior to it that to, it to some measure you know, is, is moving in this direction, but you, you don't get anything so uh, specific like what we now call systematic theology earlier than the Reformation. In any case, this is a very standard one, Lewis Burkhoff's systematic theology. Now, normally, if you're looking at a Protestant systematic theology, they usually have six sections, six major sections under which other things are dealt with. So you have, for example, theology proper, which means the study of God, and so under that, you'd have a discussion of the existence of God, the attributes of God, the works of God, so creation, providence, that sort of thing, the doctrine of the Trinity. So you, you have an idea there of what that first uh, section or loci is all about. A second section is about anthropology. Not anthropology in the sense that it's usually used in a secular university context, but in the Christian sense of the study of man in relation to God. So anthropology would talk about the nature of man as God's image bearer. What does that mean? Uh, the creation of man, the origin of the soul. Is the soul, in every case, immediately created by God? So when a child is conceived, does God immediately create the soul? Or is the soul itself a, a product of procreation? That is, that God working through the male and female uh, not only causes there to be a, uh, you know, a physical uh, person conceived, but there, uh, is their soul also in some way a product of that union? 
uh, it talks about uh, man's upright condition when he was first made, the nature of the fall and guilt and corruption and these sorts of things. Uh, then the third thing that is usually covered in a systematic theology is the doctrine of Christ. And here is a, this is from Burkhoff, and, and it, it gives you an idea of what you'd find in most standard systematic theologies. So here, this is part three, the doctrine of the person and work of Christ. And so first, he deals with the person of Christ. And he talks about the doctrine of Christ in history. So how has this doctrine been understood historically? Then he looks at the names and natures of Christ. So the names of Christ, such as Rock, Messiah, Lord, Jesus, and so forth. Natures of Christ, his humanity and his deity. And then he looks at the unipersonality of Christ, though Christ is has two natures, deity and humanity. Nevertheless, these two natures are united in his one person. He's not two persons, but one person, and that a divine person, right? It's a divine person who personalized that human nature, a fully human nature, body and soul, uh, united to the divine nature in the person of Christ. So then he goes on to talk about the states of Christ, First, his state of humiliation, meaning his descent into the world, his incarnation, his sufferings, the sufferings that he endured throughout his life, the unbelief, the mockery, the malediction of sinners, all of it, not just what happened at the cross or the trials up, leading up to it, uh, his death, his burial, and his descent. Then it talks about the state of exaltation, uh, Christ's resurrection from the dead, his ascension into heaven, his session or being seated at and reigning from the right hand of God, and then his physical future return in glory. And then it moves on to talk in a third section of the third main heading uh, about the offices of Christ. So here it talks about the prophetic office, the priestly office, and then along with the priestly office, it discusses things like the cause and necessity of the atonement, the nature of the atonement, divergent theories of the atonement, the purpose and extent of the atonement, the intercessory work of Christ, and then finally Christ's third office, his kingly office. All right. If nothing else, maybe that whet your appetite to pick up a good systematic theology like Burkhoff's. In any case, there was a reason for this. So this is the sort of thing that you'll find it's standard across the board in Protestant systematic texts. This is what I was used to, and it, it's not as if I wasn't aware <laughs> of the Mariolatry of Rome and the East, but it never ceases to be jarring when you see some of the things that is said and done with respect to Mary in Romanism and in the East. But uh, anyways, for, for all that, I, uh, uh, I was surprised. Uh, not long ago, I picked up Ludwig Ott's Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma. This is one of the things that I was reading in preparation for my hoped for debate with William Allbark. Uh, so I, I don't know, I guess maybe I, maybe I benefited to some degree <laughs> in spite of, in spite of him backing out of the debate. I don't know in what way, <laughs> but I read this to apprise myself of a very significant Roman Catholic dogmatician. Ludwig Ott is a highly regarded dogmatician in the Roman Church. But looking in his systematic, it was it was very interesting. Here's book three, and this is where you get his discussion of the doctrine of God the Redeemer. And I'm not going to go through all of this, but you see, here's part one, the doctrine of the person of the Redeemer, very similar. At this point, he's following the lead 
already blazed by Protestants. He's discussing the doctrine of God, the Redeemer, and first, the person of the Redeemer. Then, the work of the Redeemer. Looks just like Burkhoff, doesn't it? <laughs> but then suddenly, watch this. Part three, the mother of the Redeemer. <laughs> in, in its discussion, remember, remember what this is all about. Going back to, this is section three, the doctrine of God, the Redeemer. Necessary to talk about the person and work of Christ. That teaching of Scripture with respect to the accomplishment, the objective accomplishment of redemption, a Roman Catholic systematic finds it necessary to have a whole section on Mary, the mother of the Redeemer. And you can see there, underneath that main heading, it has a chapter on Mary's motherhood of God, chapter 2, the privileges of the mother of God, and chapter 3, Mary's cooperation in the work of redemption. Okay? This is a standard Roman Catholic dogmatic text. All right. Here's the chapter on Mary's perpetual virginity. I just want to point something out to you really quickly. I hope you guys can see that. I realize when I show these pictures sometimes from books, it unfortunately, is not very big, but it says underneath Mary's perpetual virginity, Mary was a virgin before, during, and after the birth of Jesus Christ. So this is the Roman Catholic claim. Mary was not only a virgin when she conceived and not only did not have relations with Joseph prior to giving birth to Jesus, but even in giving birth, Mary did not technically lose her virginity. Now, those who know anything about human anatomy and giving birth know that if Mary gave birth to Jesus, then at that point she ceased to be a virgin uh, in, in a technical sense. Right? Well, what Rome is claiming is not even in the birth of Christ did Mary lose her virginity. Now, what this means is this is why some people will say things like it's it's as if you know Jesus was just beamed out of her, right? Like uh, something in Star Trek. Uh, she didn't have any pain when she gave birth to him. There was no pain. It wasn't like we know of uh, what we know of as a birth. There was no pain, and and Jesus did not in in passing through the uh, birth canal. Uh, caused Mary to cease to be a virgin, and she never had relations after that. She continued to be a virgin. But here's the thing I especially want you to notice. Right underneath it, it says, De Fide. De Fide. De Fide is a way of saying this is a matter of Faith. I mean, not, not simply that this is something we believe on faith, but it's saying this is something that is essential to the faith. This is something which anybody who wants to claim to be a Christian and have a right to be within the church as a member of her and receive the sacraments and so forth, one must believe this. If one does not believe that Mary continued to be a virgin after the time that she gave birth to Jesus, then one is, by virtue of that, not, in fact, holding to the faith. Okay? This is de fide, according to Rome. Now, let me show you. This is what Ott himself says with respect to this uh, sort of thing. By dogma, in the strict sense, is understood a truth immediately— revealed by God, which has been proposed by the magisterium of the Church to be believed as such. The First Vatican Council explains, quote, All those things are to be believed with divine and Catholic faith that are contained in the Word of God, written or handed down, and which by the Church, either in solemn judgment or through her ordinary and universal teaching office, are proposed for belief as having been divinely revealed. End quote. So that was Ott quoting Vatican I. Now Ott continues, Dogma in its strict sense is the object of both divine and Catholic faith. 
It is the object of divine faith by reason of its divine revelation, and it is the object of Catholic faith on account of its infallible doctrinal definition by the Church. If a baptized person deliberately denies or doubts a dogma in the strict sense, which is what it means to call the doctrine of Mary's perpetual virginity de fide, if a baptized person deliberately denies or doubts a dogma in the strict sense, he is guilty of the sin of heresy and automatically becomes subject to the punishment of excommunication. Okay, so understand, according to Ott, which is just the view of the Roman Church at this point, belief in Mary's perpetual virginity is an obligatory doctrine. One must believe it or you are a heretic and you are excluded from the church. And at least according to Rome, uh, in her history, that means that one is outside of that body that will be saved. So outside of the church, there is no possibility of salvation according to Rome. Rome is the true church. Those who don't believe this doctrine are outside of her, don't belong to her, are heretics, and so forth. So th that's the stakes. And so this is why I'm asking the question in light of what Scripture says. Do we get the impression in reading Scripture that this is true, first of all, is this something that Scripture seems to be interested in trying to communicate to us? I'm not, I'm not saying, do we have grounds in, from Scripture to believe that it's false? That's a different issue. We'll look more at that next time. What I'm asking is, do we have reason to believe from Scripture that this is something that's true? And is this something that Scripture seems interested in communicating to us and imposing on us? Is it something that Scripture seems interested in communicating to us as a matter of salvific necessity, such that anyone who does not believe this doctrine does not belong to Christ's church? Okay, well, not to leave the Eastern Orthodox people out. It's so easy to leave them out. They have been largely irrelevant for most of the last thousand years. But... So many of them are clamoring for my attention these days that uh, uh, I thought I'd all include them. This is uh, from Proto Presbyter. <laughs> you got to love the names you find in Eastern Orthodoxy. <laughs> you know, we're all we're all busy talking about whether there's this third office known as bishop that's separate from elder, and it's not in the New Testament or in in the early church. Bishop and presbyter are just interchangeable terms for the same office. But if in the Eastern Church, you've got all these different names. Anyways, this is proto-presbyter Michael Pomazansky in his Orthodox Dogmatic Theology. Now, you don't get too many of these sorts of things from the Eastern Church. These guys don't like to be systematic. In any case, uh, Here's chapter 6. In chapter 6, he gets around to the topic of salvation, God, uh, the, the, the person and work of Christ, really is what this section's all about. And so here you see it's on God and the salvation of mankind. So he first has a section on the economy of our salvation, then the preparation of the human race to receive the Savior, so the stuff that went on prior to and leading up to the time of Christ bringing about the fullness of time. Then, as you would expect in a section dealing with God and the salvation of mankind, a discussion of the incarnation of the Son of God. And then, as you'd expect from one of these apostate apostolic churches, a whole section on Mary. Now, note what Pomazansky says with respect to belief in Mary's perpetual virginity. It says, when the heretics and simple blasphemers refuse to acknowledge the ever-virginity of the mother of God on the grounds that the evangelists mention the brothers and sisters of Jesus, they are refuted by the following facts from the gospel. Now, we're going to look at his facts from the gospel in, in just a moment here, but I don't want you to miss he refers to those who don't believe in the perpetual virginity of Mary as heretics and blasphemers. Just like Ott, 
you are a heretic and a blasphemer and excluded from the church of Christ outside of the realm of salvation, outside of the kingdom, if you refuse to believe this doctrine. Okay? You would think that this doctrine then is something that is clearly taught in the Bible, that the apostles would be concerned to be communicating this, and certainly wouldn't speak in such a way that could be ambiguous that might lead people to think, no, Mary didn't remain a virgin. Otherwise, are they really doing their duty as heralds of the good news of salvation? I mean, Paul in Romans, doesn't he? Doesn't he tell us that he's telling us what the gospel is? If you look at the dogmatics of Pomazansky and Ott, Belief in Mary's perpetual virginity is part of the gospel. It's something that must be believed. It's something that must be believed on pain of excommunication. Okay. Well, here's his grand case, and I'm not pretending this is the best case somebody can make for Mary's perpetual virginity, but it is Pomazansky's case, so we're going to read it real quick. Here's his proof. Okay. Now, now this is funny. Before I before I read it, okay, he he's going to give you the proof that. Mary remained a virgin. He's going to deal with this issue of the evangelist saying that G, uh, Jesus had other brothers and sisters. And then he has an A, B, and C. Now, normally that means that you're getting three arguments, but really all he's doing is padding his case because you'll notice the first one isn't really a, an argument of itself, not without B and C. So there's really, uh, <laughs> there's not three arguments here, but anyways, he, so here are his facts that prove the perpetual virginity of Mary. A, in the Gospels, there are named four brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Jude. And there are also mentioned the sisters of Jesus. No fewer than three, as is evident in the words, and his sisters, are they not all with us? In other words, if it would have just been two, then it would have said, are they not both with us? But since it says all, there's at least three sisters. Okay. On the other hand, B, in the account of the journey, listen to this, in the account of the journey to Jerusalem of the 12-year-old boy Jesus, where there is mention of the kinsfolk and acquaintances in the midst of whom they were seeking Jesus, and where it is likewise mentioned that Mary and Joseph every year journeyed from faraway Galilee to Jerusalem, no reason is given to think that there were present other younger children with Mary. It was thus that the first 12 years of the Lord's earthly life proceeded. Okay, so because the Gospel of Luke mentions Jesus going with his parents up to Jerusalem, but doesn't mention that he had other siblings, therefore he didn't have other siblings. Okay, this is a logical howler. It's as fallacious as I could possibly think. I mean, well, there's other seriously fallacious things, but it's seriously bad. Right? This is an argument from silence. It's a non sequitur. It does not at all follow that because Luke doesn't mention whether they had a pet dog, therefore they don't have a pet dog named Fido. Right? It's utterly irrelevant. You, you, you can't infer something from nothing okay? unless you have reason to believe that such would have been mentioned. But we have all kinds of reason to believe that all sorts of things are true that weren't mentioned. Right? Mark doesn't mention the virgin birth of Christ. Does that mean Jesus wasn't born of a virgin? According to Mark, John doesn't mention it. John doesn't even you know, mention that, uh, well, I mean, I suppose we could look elsewhere in John's gospel to realize he has a mother and so forth, but he doesn't mention the birth of Christ. He doesn't mention, uh, he doesn't detail for us the baptism. We get a hindsight, you know, after the fact uh, view of Jesus. Anyways, the, the idea that you can infer a positive conclusion from a nothing, a blank, is utterly fallacious. Well, here's his last effort at proving her perpetual virginity. And this is his whole case, by the way. When, about 20 years after the above-mentioned journey, Mary stood at the cross of the Lord, she was alone, and she was entrusted by her divine son to his disciple John. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. Evidently, as the ancient Christians also understood it, the evangelists speak either of half-brothers and sisters or of cousins. Okay? So from the fact that Mary is entrusted to John, it proves that she didn't have other sons. How does it prove that? It doesn't prove that. 
Isn't it possible that there could be another reason that Jesus entrusts Mary to John? Isn't it already suspicious that John is there? In fact, let me play his game. There's no mention of his other brothers being there. Perhaps they all abandoned Mary, right? Perhaps, you know, there's all sorts of other ways you could do this. But the fact is, Christ entrusted her to John. It doesn't say because she didn't have any other uh, kids. Now, somebody might say, well, it would have been natural for uh, uh, another son, for the responsibility to devolve upon the next older son. But what if you have mitigating circumstances, such as those other sons were unbelievers? Would not then her divine son have divined this and known that these were not fitting people to entrust his mother to, and therefore entrust her to the care of that disciple whom he especially loved? Right, John's name among the disciples is the one whom Jesus loved. Who else would he entrust his mother to? That's not proof that he didn't have other brothers or that she didn't have children. It's simply proof that it was to John that Jesus believed his mother's care should be given. All right, that's his grand case. And with such a weak case, again, I want to remind you, he accuses those as did Ott, who don't believe in Mary's perpetual virginity, of being blasphemers and uh, heretics, to be excluded from the church outside of salvation. Okay, so those are the stakes according to Rome and the East. Well, let's look at Scripture. Now, in fact, even before moving on to, to several passages, and again, remember, my point here is not to prove yet whether or not Mary did not remain a virgin. My question here that I'm addressing is whether or not it is something positively taught in the New Testament, whether this is something that the New Testament writers are concerned to convey and deliver to people as de fide matters, things that must be believed for salvation. Is this something that the New Testament authors are interested in communicating to us and co commanding our assent? Or rather, do they speak in such a way as though they do not care if you misunderstand it as saying that Mary had other children? Well, just think of Galatians 1.19. In Galatians 1.19, Paul refers to James in distinction from other people named James. He calls him the Lord's brother. He does not stop to explain, oh, and by that, I do not at all mean that he was the son of Mary. Paul has utterly no concern whether, in fact, I, I think it most natural that John or Paul is saying that is Christ's natural brother. Uh, I tip my hand a little bit. But uh, quite apart from that, Paul says James, the Lord's brother, without any hesitation. There's no temerity on Paul's part. Oh, no, somebody might misunderstand. They might think that this James was the offspring of Mary. He never does that. None of the New Testament writers do that. Here's Mark chapter 3, and it's paralleled in Matthew chapter 12. It says, Then his mother and his brothers arrived, and standing outside, they sent word to him and called him. Note, it mentions his mothers and brothers. Now, what do you think you'd find in any Roman Catholic commentary on this text, or any Eastern Orthodox commentary on this text? They would quickly want to explain to you that his brothers doesn't literally mean flesh and blood brothers, or children of Mary. Does the apostle, or does Mark do that? Does Mark stop and say, don't misunderstand? We don't mean that these are Mary's children. Perish the thought. You'll perish if you believe that. <laughs> no, it says his mother and his brothers arrived, and standing outside, they sent word to him and called him. Now, somebody can go on as much as they like about how the word brothers could possibly mean cousins in certain contexts. Okay. My point isn't that it doesn't mean that here. My point is that 
Mark has no concern to disambiguate that. There is no concern on Mark's part to say this does not mean blood brothers. You, you see the point, right? Then verse 32, a crowd was sitting around him and they said to him, now catch this. Behold, your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. So the people refer to them as his mother and his brothers. Answering them, he said, who are my mother and my brothers? Now, under, now get this. There's, there's a comparison and contrast that's being made here. It all rests on what it means to call somebody your mother and your brother or brothers. And later it's going to mention his sisters or sister. Uh, well, he's going to say, who are my mother and brothers? And then point out that those are his brother and sister and mother who do the will of God. But notice the whole point here is kinship, either biological or spiritual. Jesus is saying those are his true, or in a more important sense, his mother and brothers and sisters who do the will of his Father in heaven. Do you think that what Jesus is saying is that those who do the will of my Father in heaven are my spiritual cousins? Is that the point that Jesus is trying to make? See, the very logic of this points in the direction of understanding his mother and brothers in verse 31 as literal mothers and brothers, mother and brothers. But I go on. My, my main point here is simply that there's no effort here to disambiguate this. It's just laid out there and given to people to take in its most natural way. Now we have, uh, this is from, excuse me, this is from Mark 6. It says, Jesus went out from there and came into his hometown and his disciples followed him. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue and the many listeners were astonished saying, where did this man get these things? And what is this wisdom given to him and such miracles as these performed by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Now I have Judas highlighted there as well. It's not Judas Iscariot, of course, uh, but I have it highlighted there because as we'll look more at next time, the apostle Jude, or at least uh, well, Jude in the New Testament refers to James as his brother. So here, the brothers of Jesus are identified as James, Joseph, and Judas, and Simon. And in the book of Jude, James is identified as his brother. In any case, it goes on to say, Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his own relatives and in his own household. Okay. Notice Jesus is in uh, his hometown and the people there are not giving him the honor that is his due and even his own relatives and those who are in his own household. Who, who are those? His sisters, his brothers, his mother. Right are likewise uh, not giving him the requisite honor. Okay? That to me suggests more than simply uh, cousins. But in any case, is there any intent here on Mark's part to communicate that these are not near kin, that is part of Jesus' nuclear family? Is Mark at all concerned here that people might take this wrong? Is Mark at all concerned here to, to perpetuate the notion of a perpetual virgin? Absolutely not. It's not found anywhere in Mark. It's not found anywhere in Matthew. It's not found anywhere in Luke, anywhere in John, anywhere in Paul, Peter, uh, anywhere else in the New Testament. Here's John chapter 7. After these things, Jesus was walking in Galilee, for he was unwilling to walk in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the feast of the Jews, the feast of booths, was near. Therefore his brothers said to him, Leave here and go into Judea, so that your disciples also may see your works, which you are doing. Does John stop and say, Don't misunderstand this. These are not biological brothers. 
Does John show any concern for people potentially going in that direction? Is he trying to convey that Mary is a perpetual virgin, or does he seem altogether unconcerned with it? I suggest it's the latter. Therefore, his brother said to him, you know, leave and, and do this. And, and then verse four, no one does anything in secret when he himself seeks to be known publicly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers were believing in him. Not even his brothers. Right? Is it saying not even his cousins were believing in him? Or, uh, you know, is that the point? Then it goes on when his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he himself also went up. Again, there's no interest here to disambiguate this, say, oh, no, not natural blood brothers or more distant relatives or anything like that. It's, it's very clearly just being put out there to be understood in its most natural sense. But in any case, there's no effort here to argue for Mary's perpetual virginity or uh, protect people from potentially misunderstanding and thinking that Mary had other children. There's no interest in this de fide doctrine of the Papists. No interest in this, you are a blasphemer if you don't believe it, doctrine of the Eastern Orthodox, who tell you not to read the Bible because it's a source of mischief. You know why it's a source of mischief? Because you won't believe their innovations if you look at the Bible. If you read the Bible you, uh, without listening to them and having them tell you what the Spirit says, the deep things of the Spirit, right? If you don't listen to them and you read the Bible, you won't believe what they're telling you. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. Oh, wait, did I mean to? Uh, oh, okay. So this is Acts 1. As uh, they returned, this is after Jesus' ascension. When they had entered the city, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. That is Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus and Simon, the zealot and Judas, the son of James. So you see, you have several Jameses here. But then notice what it says. These all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. Once again, a mention of his brothers, and again, mentioned along with Mary, and again, no attempt to disambiguous and certainly or disambiguate it, and certainly no attempt to try and communicate the notion that Mary was a perpetual virgin. It's simply not in the text. It's not a concern of the text, much less is it something that the text says one must believe upon pain of damnation. Rome's doctrine is not there. The East doctrine is not there. It's doctrine. It's dogma. It's what it says is a matter that must be believed. It's not there. It's absent from the word of God, that source of mischief, according to Rome in the East. That mischievous text does not teach Rome's innovations. One more time. Let me just look at one more text. <laughs> Am I not free? This is 1 Corinthians 9. Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. My defense to those who examine me is this. Do we not have a right to eat and drink? Do we not have a right to take along a believing wife, even as the rest of the apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Wait a minute. What is the first pope doing with a wife? <laughs> Anyways, do we not have a right to take along a believing wife, even as the rest of the apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or do only Barnabas and I not have a right to refrain from working? Once again, just like we saw in Mark, which has its parallels in Matthew, and just like we saw in John, so we also see in Paul, again, along with Galatians 1.19, a reference to siblings of Jesus. No intention of disambiguating it. No concern that somebody might think that Jesus had siblings, brothers and sisters, just like he had a mother, and therefore that his mother also had offspring. There's no intent, intent on the part of the apostles to communicate this doctrine. It is purely a doctrine of Rome's traditions. Now you see why Rome insists on its traditions being taught, because its traditions are not found in that mischievous text called the Bible, the Word of God, the Word of the Holy Spirit. 
You have to go to them to get the deep things of the Spirit, right? Not to the Word of God. The God-breathed scriptures. Go to Rome. Go to the East. They will tell you what God. Trust them. Just trust them. <laughs> trust them. Don't worry about the Bible. We'll tell you what it says. Oy vey. Oy vey. All right. Do you have any questions on any of that? Like I said, this is part one. There's more to come. I just wanted to do this brief thing, relatively brief. Uh, we've already been on for an hour, but uh, I wanted to begin with that because I want you to know the stakes. According to Rome, you are doomed and damned. You are outside the church, the body of Christ for which he died. You are outside of his body if you do not believe their inventions. If you do not believe their innovations, okay, the things that are you know born, you know, fully grown out of their foreheads, they dreamed up, you know, the stuff that they went down the rabbit hole and brought back up with them. If you don't believe that stuff, you will perish. Where in the world is that taught in the word of God? It's not. That's why they don't want you to read it. That's why they have whole catechisms that talk about how mischievous the Bible is. Not just the East, by the way, but Rome. Rome doesn't want you reading the Bible. Now, now, of course, the cat's out of the bag, right? Now everybody could read a Bible. It's as easy as picking up your phone. Now Rome has to scurry and scamper like it never had to before. People can read the Bible, that forbidden book, whether they like it or not. Right? And, and people can go to debates with the Bible, and uh, <laughs> well, I was going to say something else, but I'm going to I'm going to save that for for future time. But uh, all right, Archbishop says he's a little late. Well, you're going to have to go back because uh, you missed you missed uh, all sorts of things, including the Eastern Church telling you not to read the Bible and stuff like that. <laughs> uh, so Sandra says, Anthony, can you touch on that prophecy that talks about Messiah coming from the line of David, but not through David's seed? Um, I don't know what you're talking about. So I, I think maybe, maybe you're thinking of, there was a curse pronounced on Jeconiah that nobody descending from David through him would sit on the throne that doesn't mean that the Messiah would not be a son of David. All throughout the Old Testament, he is said to be uh, the seed of David. But the way that's circumvented is precisely by virtue of Jesus being virginally conceived. Mary was, uh, her her line is tr not traced through Jeconiah and Jesus is, but, but it is from David. Mary's descent is from David. And so that curse is bypassed by means of that. Uh, there's also stuff in the uh, Jewish sources indicating that Jeconiah repented and, and the curse was lifted and that sort of thing, but that's all unnecessary in any case. It may be true, but it's unnecessary. Uh, and that's the only thing I can think of that you might be talking about. Um, so John says, how can the Roman Catholic Church say that so blatantly and not feel ashamed? It's like they haven't read the scriptures. Or, yeah, and along with that, uh, they love their traditions, right? Matthew 15, the religious leaders went to Jesus and they complained, as they often did, about the conduct of Christ and the apostles because they didn't keep the traditions of the elders. They say to him, you know, how, how can you flout the traditions? And then Jesus responds to them by saying, you guys honor your traditions over the word of God. Right? He, he quotes Moses, a command that they have found a way to circumvent. And then he goes on to, to say that uh, Isaiah, the prophet, spoke rightly concerning you. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. These people teach as the doctrines uh, for doctrines, the commandments of men, okay? the traditions of men. They love their traditions more than the word of God. 
They love their traditions more than the Word of God, so much so that they will anathematize people that don't believe in their pet doctrines. I said before that, you know, for me, the question of Mary's perpetual virginity, and really for Protestants generally, is pretty much a moot issue in the sense that it doesn't carry the kind of weight that it does for Rome. For Rome, Mary's virginity is necessary to their overall view of Mary's grandeur and her exaltation. The whole cult of Mary, and that's not my term, by the way, that's used by Roman Catholics, the cult of Mary, the, the hyperdulia, the hyper adoration that they render to Mary, even above all other angels and saints, which you'll forgive us for saying looks like nothing more than worship. But in any case, that which they render under her, they call the cult of Mary. And uh, in the Protestant view of things, we can have a high view of Mary as the mother of our Lord without thinking that makes her an appropriate object of adoration, right? of hyperdulia. And with uh, the perpetual virginity, in other words, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't amount to, it doesn't mount up to all that Rome wants to say about Mary and what they want to direct to her. There are plenty of women who have remained virgins. That doesn't make them appropriate objects of adoration. Some people, well, <laughs> thank you, uh, Corinth, by the way. Thank you so much. So it's really, you know, as a Protestant, it would make no difference to me. Obviously, I insist that she conceived as a virgin, and she did not have relations with Joseph prior to uh, giving birth to our Lord. But the idea that she had to remain a virgin, uh, it just isn't a, a, a teaching of Scripture, for one, but it, uh, it's, it's not something that I need in order to hold her in high regard. And even if, you know, if it were true, and, and all sorts of other things like uh, suppose suppose uh, Mary uh, was raised up to heaven. Now, even that, you know, it wouldn't make her, in my eyes as a Protestant, what she is to the Roman Catholic, to their whole piety, right? Their whole frame of mind and life. It's directed towards her. We're all going to ascend someday, right? Uh, Elijah and Elisha ascended. In, in a biblical context, it simply doesn't lead to the conclusion that Rome thinks it does. But, but without these things, the Roman system falls apart. You know, With these things, it doesn't necessarily follow. But without them, it certainly falls apart. Um, so... Squatch says, Anthony Rogers, the reason why cousins was not used in the Greek is because the use for cousins is the same as brother. Um, yeah, I don't, I wasn't making a comment on, uh, I'm not sure if I'm even following. I wasn't making a comment on whether it should have used another word or the word for brothers can mean cousins. I didn't even dispute that. My point is, the most natural way of understanding this is as brothers, what we mean by brothers in English. And if that's not what it means in those contexts, the authors of the New Testament had no interest in telling us that. They had no interest in making sure that nobody made the mistake of assuming that these were blood brothers, literal offspring of Mary but actually cousins. There's no interest. My whole point is the New Testament does not teach her perpetual virginity. Even if you think she remained a virgin, the New Testament does not teach it. And it seems unconcerned if somebody doesn't believe that and certainly doesn't make it a doctrine that one must believe or else be doomed. That's, that's the point I'm driving at. So <laughs> So now uh, Gunstar says you're, uh, oh, I thought you were talking to me. <laughs> um, all right. Bible Care says he's been barking all night. Okay, I assume you're talking about uh, Squatch. I'll, I'll just call you Sasquatch. How's that? 
hey, in fact, you've got a little Sasquatch. You've got a little Yeti there. So I, I wasn't being as uh, as witty as I thought. You got a little Sasquatch there. <laughs> maybe maybe you should go sit with the Sasquatches and. Uh, OK, so now Squatch says they didn't use I said they didn't use the word cousins. Sasquatch, my young Yeti friend, go back and listen. Never at any point did I say they didn't use the word cousins. <laughs> uh, I'm sure that between the two of us, there's only one of us that knows Greek and it's not you. But even if you do, it's irrelevant because I didn't make that argument. My whole point was they did not feel the need to disambiguate the word and say not brothers in the sense of blood brothers, but cousins. They, they didn't do anything to uh, disambiguate that. They're, they're altogether unconcerned, altogether unconcerned with trying to push Rome's innovation. Okay. All right, Romans said, uh, per their logic, the perpetual virginity of Joseph is better. He was virgin before even the conception of Jesus, during and through Jesus' birth, and remained chaste through the marriage without adult relations. Yeah. Now, why doesn't Joseph get his due? Now, there are some hat tips towards Joseph, but he certainly snuffed. I mean, he, he raised Jesus. Uh, I think I think he deserves more than they give him. Uh, anyways, um, okay, so Squatch wants to keep saying, I said something I didn't. Okay, let's pretend for a moment, Yeti. Let's, let's pretend with your aboriginal... Uh, or Neanderthal Sasquatch brain that I actually said that. Okay, now I deny it. Okay, how's that? I didn't say it, but to help you along, the whole point is in passage after passage, it refers to the brothers of Jesus, the sisters of Jesus. At no point does it ever attempt to disambiguate that and say not near relations in the sense of actual blood brothers. And so it doesn't do anything to try and disambiguate that because my point is not to prove that Mary did not remain a virgin. Stay tuned for next time. My whole point was to show that the New Testament writers are altogether unconcerned with what you guys think is a matter of salvific necessity. They're unconcerned with it entirely. It's, it's never a doctrine that the, the, the gospel writers or the uh, authors of the epistles are peddling. It's not there at all. Okay, that's the point I was making. And I think that was clear, and I think everybody else got it. And it's certainly not something that they teach one must believe de fide. Okay? It's not a divinely revealed doctrine that the church had the right to formally dogmatize and impose on the faith of believers. All right, let's see. Jay says, uh, there are booklets full of prayer to Mary, literally booklets full, unreal. Oh yeah. So I, I remember um, one of the things it's similar, not, not exactly on Mary per se, but it's, it's this, whole stream of, of stuff that goes together. There was a statement that I was reading one time on transubstantiation. So transubstantiation is another one of Rome's made up doctrines where the priest says the words of consecration, hoc est corpus meum, this is my body. And saying that the bread and the wine are transformed into the literal body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. That's Rome's doctrine. The East basically agrees with Rome, though she wouldn't describe it philosophically in the same way. In any case, same doctrine. But I was reading this source, and it says, when the priest utters the words of consecration, the immortal God bows his head in obedience to the command of the priest and, and becomes bread and wine or whatever. Uh, forget the exact last part of it. But I remember reading that just being, you know, mortified, thinking, what in the world is this? Talk about blasphemy. A priest speaks these words and the immortal God bows his head at his word and now, you know, 
uh, the bread and wine are transformed into his body and blood. Well, it's the same sort of thing when you look at these prayers to Mary. They are off the rails, right? The Bible nowhere endorses prayers to Mary or anyone other than God. And it certainly doesn't endorse prayers with the content that Roman Catholics offer up to her. Uh, I quick says Squatch is the one person in here who doesn't understand the point, And he also happens to be the one person who believes in this dogma. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what do you do? What do you do? All right. Um, let's see here. Do we have any questions? Any questions? Any questions? Okay, so Claire says, is it a possibility that Joseph had other wives? Now, theoretically, that's a possibility, right? So that's part of the reason for doing what I've done just now. I think that there's a lot to sort through when it comes to identifying certain people. It's not as cut and dry and like for example who is james who is james the lord's brother i mentioned that there are numerous jameses but sometimes it's not even easy to tell how many jameses there are and then which one it is we can rule out certain people and, and i think in going through all the information we can say that james the lord's brother was his biological brother through mary but but the the whole point is even apart from being able to do that, Christian faith is not a matter of, it's not like you have like the word faith movement, right? The, the word faith movement has taught this concept of faith that's foreign to the Bible, right? It's basically faith in faith, right? Just believe and it'll happen. Christian faith is faith in God's promises. It rests on God's word. Otherwise, it's not Christian faith. A okay? Christian faith, to be Christian faith means faith in what God has said. That's Christian faith. It's not just believing what we want, right? There's nothing in Scripture that teaches us, and that therefore can be an object of our faith, that Mary remained a virgin and didn't have children. It's not there at all. But is it possible that she did? I mean, just without other things being considered, yeah. And and uh, again, I would have no problem with that. It wouldn't bother me one way or the other, right? But in the Roman Catholic system, you cannot have that. It, it's not even a live possibility. For Rome, it's a matter of divine faith to believe that Mary remained a virgin, or else you're outside of the church and devoid of salvation. So that's the first issue that I'm really raising here leading up to next time where I talk about some of the, the details that have to be sorted through. The New Testament nowhere teaches that Mary remained a virgin, and it certainly nowhere says that this is something that one must believe in order to have Christian faith. All right. Corinth says, Rome really didn't leave people with an easy way out. They concocted a theological novelty and then pinned their followers to the wall with their allegedly infallible counsels. Yeah, in fact, uh, so going along with uh, this too, Melissa says the uh, transubstantiation uh, boggles the mind. So you got it. You're pretty close there. Uh, it's one word, uh, transubstantiation. But talk about pinning people to the wall. Rome didn't just assert dogmatically on her infallible authority that bread and wine turns into the body and blood of Christ. She actually propounded a theory known as transubstantiation, namely the idea that the substance turns into Christ's body, blood, soul, and divinity, but the accidental qualities, the appearances remain the same. That's why it still looks like, smells like, tastes like bread and wine, but it really isn't, right? Substantially, it's Christ. I mean, that creates a problem because 
you know, you'd, you'd like to think that if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck and so forth, then it is a duck, but not on Rome's view, right? Appearances are deceiving. It's not really what it looks like. Work that into your epistemology, right? Uh, how often is that sort of thing what's happening? Uh, you know, things look a certain way. I mean, I'm not saying that things are always the way they appear, but generally speaking, they are, right? Uh, but Rome even go, is going further when it says that the accidents, the, the, the look, the smell, the taste, everything is the same but uh, as bread and wine, but the, the substance is different. But then you, you've also got this problem that the New Testament writers continue to call the consecrated elements bread and wine. They don't switch from calling them bread and wine to calling them Jesus. They, they continue to speak of them as though they are signs through which we partake of Christ, to be sure, by the Spirit through faith, but not carnally, right? Anyways, uh, and, and the same thing with, with Mary. I mean, you, you, you've got Rome insisting on certain doctrines for which there's actually very little... Uh, so, certain doctrines, like uh, it's funny watching Catholics. I mean, there's no question that eventually you get these things developing. And so at some point in church history, you can find them. And then the question is, how far back? And Rome always wants to say, well, whatever you find that's advocated by Rome was always taught. Uh, but there, there are certain doctrines that come along in the third century, and that's a problem, but it's not as big of a problem as a doctrine that doesn't come along until the sixth century or the seventh century or something like that. So, for example, something like the bodily assumption of Mary or her immaculate conception. This creates a huge problem for the Roman Catholics who otherwise want to argue that, okay, well, it's not found in the word of God, but it is found in tradition, right? Yeah, Dinah, Dinah says, it wouldn't bother me one way or another, exactly. Yeah, so just to reiterate that, I, I'm saying that if Mary remained a virgin, praise the Lord. Uh, if she had relations with Joseph, praise the Lord. This doesn't at all amount to a, you know, there's there's nothing there that makes this a matter of faith uh, on which is contingent your salvation. Okay. Scripture makes no effort to prove this and seems altogether unconcerned if somebody takes things the other way. All right, Archbishop said something in response to, let's see what, oh yeah, uh, so I was going to look at that text tonight, but that's part of what I have pushed off till the next episode. I do think it's significant. So if those of you want to look it up, you can look it up, but 69 you have this parallelism in the Hebrew of the Psalter where the Messiah is talking and refers to his brothers, and then in the parallel line refers to them as the sons of his mother. Now, there are certain ways that Roman Catholics and others try to get around that, and I'll, I'll talk about that and why I don't buy it, but uh, you do have there a reference to Messiah's brothers, and they're more specifically referred to as the sons of his mother. So yeah, I think that's a great text. So David, David, uh, let's see. Oh, I see. We've got, we've got an anti-Pauler, <laughs> an anti-Pauler. Poor David. <laughs> you know, it, I used to get around before before the internet. By around, I mean I used to interact with a lot of people. I did a lot of reading. And so I would hear about all sorts of stuff that I, I in some ways, think, you know, life was better for the average Christian when you didn't have to know how many theological crackpots there are out there. 
<laughs> but now there's the internet and you can't help but turn every corner and run into one, right? You got all these people that uh, all want to make their own religion. They're, they're like the Pappas in the, in the East, right? Just make it up as you go along. Um, I especially have more appreciation of it now that I read the Psalter in a messianic fashion. Thanks in no small part to Anthony. Hey, praise the Lord. That's great to hear. Um, you know, it's, uh, I've, I've mentioned one of my professors a lot. Uh, I, I loved all my professors, learned a great deal from all of them. But one I always mention or often mention is Dr. Michael Morales. And he's somebody that gave me an especial appreciation for the Old Testament and certain things that uh, I now make much use of uh, and apply to you know, further studies, but it's, it's funny because every time I pick up a book that I really like, I'm not surprised. Remember I mentioned this book earlier in the show. Thanks again to John a for getting it. But I, I looked in the beginning of it and one of the blurbs recommending the book is by my old professor, Dr. Michael Morales. And then the new president of the seminary also has a blurb over here. <laughs> I, he wasn't president when I was there, so uh, I haven't really sat under him. But uh, there's another book that I was just looking at uh, the other day. Not physically. I, I was looking at this book that was being advertised in Zondervan's magazine. And now I don't know where it's at. But... Um, I was like, man, this book looks really good. And sure enough, I look and who's commending the book, recommending the book is Michael Morales. So uh, Michael Morales, he didn't talk a lot about the Psalter per se, but he talked a lot about the, the Torah and the shape of scripture, the canonical shape and reading things canonically and that sort of thing. And that's some of the technical terminology used for what it, you know, what I've talked about sometimes when I, when I talk about the Psalter. Uh, so there are people, and I was trying to think of the guy's name the other day and I can't remember who it is, but there's somebody in particular that I really like when it comes to the Psalter. Um, he wrote a whole book on Psalm, one and Psalm two. And then he contributed a chapter in another book on Psalm three. And then in another book that has like 50 different authors, <laughs> believe it or not, uh, he contributed a section in there on the Psalter. I can't think of his name. Anyways, anyways, I'm, I'm rambling here. Oh, so look at that. Diner review says, have you ever read John Salehammer's Penetica's narrative? Yeah. Uh, Sailhammer is one of the guys that my professor, uh, would have, uh, pointed to. In fact, some of the stuff he discussed in class, uh, was original to Sailhammer. So, you know, you always have these scholars building on each other. And so Sailhammer is one of the guys that had some significant stuff that he he always recommended so yeah i have i have cell hammer right there and it took his narrative oh don't crash don't crash uh. there he is cell hammer Now you see how now you see how how I move around in my office. <laughs> that that's how the day goes. I, I bounce around getting books. No, I do more than that. I do more than that. Oh, hey, look at that. Brother Brian says I got Exodus Old and New by Michael Morales. Yeah, that's a great book. My favorite was um, Who Shall Ascend, but Exodus Old and New is a great book. All right. Wait, is David still? I see people still talking to David. Um, Eric says, David Mitchell for Psalms is good. I don't think I've read Mitchell. Oh, Roman says, uh, Seth Postel. Oh, you're, you're recommending. Now, I like Seth Postel, but he's not the guy I was thinking of. 
In fact, uh, you know, Seth Postel, if I, if I were to go pick up uh, Seth Postel's book, guess who wrote the endorsement to it? Michael Morales. <laughs> One of his books. Uh, his book, um, Adam is Israel. Yeah, Seth Postel. I, I like Seth Postel. He has a lot of good stuff. Uh, but yeah, his book, Adam as Israel. He has another book. I think it's Reading Moses, Seeing Jesus. Uh, no, I mean, if I, it would take me too long to find the author I'm thinking of. Otherwise I would just grab it. But, um, I don't even know where one of the books is that I read his stuff in. Ah, gosh. You know, sometimes I kick myself because I'll read a book and, and I don't pay too much attention to the author. And I, I'll, I'll have this book that I've read that, and I'm like, who's that author? Because I didn't even pay attention. I'm more interested in the content than the author sometimes. Anyways, uh, Eric says, John Selhammer's work is the best. Loves him and Seth Postel. Yeah, they write great stuff. Great stuff. Oh, look, Dinah Reviews. See, look at that. Dinah's on top of it tonight. <laughs> thank you, Chloe. Thank you, thank you. You all are too kind. Oh, see, Slam, Slam is laying down the law, David. She said, cite your passage. What is David talking about? Let's see. I'll entertain you for a moment. David, the guy hosting this video knows I'm right. Paul says you could eat food sacrificed to idols. If he was speaking from the uh, spirit of God, he wouldn't have said that. <laughs> what, did, what did Paul say in the context of 1 Corinthians 8 through 10? Was he quoting the spirit of God or not? In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul said, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. What Paul argues is that in principle, everything proceeds from the hand of God and is therefore good, right? As God originally created things, it's all good, very good. That means that there's not this absolute problem with eating any food because it all belongs to God. The idols are nothing in the world. Nevertheless, Paul says you shouldn't eat food offered to idols because those are ultimately offered to demons and you are partaking of the cup of demons when you eat this food. But all, all Paul's observing is that, as a matter of fact, everything belongs to God. There's nothing that really belongs to pagan gods, demons, devils, and so forth. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, right? You right now, David, are living on God's green earth. Right? You are borrowing his air and opposing his apostle, for example, right? These are all things that you're doing. Uh, but... Uh, Oops, sorry. Somebody's comment distracted me. Um, oh, <laughs> here's my Dinah says, can mods check out books from the great library back there? <laughs> so you know what? Like I always, um, I, I got in this practice a long time ago of never borrowing a book because I, I had borrowed a few books at first. And what happened was, I realized there were certain books that I wanted to have, but then when I got money to go buy a book, this is when I was younger, you know, 19, 20, so forth. I, I was like, well, I don't want to buy one I already read because then I don't have anything to read, right? I want a new book. So I would never end up buying the book that I read, but wanted because of, of hopefully using it in the future. The other thing is when I read a book, I remember where I read things. So I can't go back. That's why I don't like digital stuff. I've got plenty of digital books, but I don't use them that much because it's it's something, it just doesn't work when you're looking at a digital thing, remembering where it was. Pages are unique. Every page is like a fingerprint. So when I read a book, I kind of have an idea of what the page looks like and can find it very quickly when I go to a book if I've read it before. So I always wanted my own books and that's just what I've always done. And not that there's anything wrong by any stretch in somebody borrowing books. But, uh, for me, I was like, uh, Oh, Brian says, I recommended that book to him, man. I recommend good books, Brian. 
<laughs> Tiger says David is just distracting. Of course he is. Yeah, this, you know, uh, David doesn't like that we're talking about Paul. Paul talked about those people that like to surreptitiously slither their way into Christian context to spy out the liberty of Christians. Um, <laughs> word salad. So Psalm, the Psalms are word salad. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. David doesn't believe that. David is a contemporary Marcionite. David doesn't believe that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He doesn't believe that God created everything very good. He doesn't believe that idols are nothing, that there aren't really gods out there. There's only one true God and everything belongs to him. So that the word of God and prayer are consecrated to believers. If I accidentally eat a steak from a cow that was sacrificed to an idol, do you think I'm cursed? No, I'm blessed. Uh, it's consecrated by the word of God and prayer. Does that mean I should just eat it? Th knowing that it was sacrificed to an idol uh, and caused somebody else to stumble? No, for the sake of Christian love, I wouldn't do that. Um, but David's not a very good reader and he doesn't like the Old Testament. He hates David uh, for some reason. I mean, yeah, you hate, you hate the psalmist. No, but Noah was accounted as righteous, even though Paul said no one was. <laughs> what, excuse me, I thought Paul was the very one who argued that people were counted righteous. But of course, I'm, I'm assuming you don't understand what counted means. Paul said precisely that Abraham was reckoned or counted righteous through faith, Genesis 15, 6. That's what Paul says in Romans 4. If Paul's the author of Hebrews, the author of Hebrews speaks of Noah being an heir of the righteousness that is by faith. So Noah received righteousness. It was counted or reckoned to him. Noah was not saved because he was inherently better than others of his time. The text says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And as the author of Hebrews says, he was reckoned righteous through faith. He was an heir of the righteousness of faith, just like Abraham, who believed God and it was credited or imputed to him as righteousness. So now you don't like Moses, you don't like Paul, you don't like David, the psalmist. What do you like? Maybe you like Marcion. Maybe you like Marcion. All right, folks. Um, if there are no more questions... Is this, is that my, uh, I don't know if that's a reference to me. KL says, have you heard the recent info that many or most Roman Catholic priests are gay? Pope Benedict said most Roman Catholic bishops are gay against the, or against the church. They focus on sin, not servanthood. Um, I didn't hear that particular thing. I did hear that there was a book that he wrote and intended to be posthumously published posthumously published uh and it's apparently got some interesting things in it i did hear something about gay priests but not specifically that most are gay i mean uh obviously he'd know better than i do if he said that but my assumption as much as i disagree with rome is that most priests aren't but if he said it i mean who am i to disagree with uh <laughs> to disagree with him about his own false church right um, that'd be interesting. I don't know. Be interesting. Harriel for mod. Harriel for mod. What does that mean? Uh, Nate says until he shaves it, you know, I've been tempted. I've been tempted a couple times to shave it. But I don't know. I, I think I'm going to keep it this time. It only, you know, it hasn't grown out as fast as it did before. So <laughs> I don't know. I, I, always, I always heard that the more you shave it, the more it'll grow out. But uh, this time I, I haven't shaved in several months, I think. I don't know. I haven't paid attention. Yeah, John A says, uh, marriage and family can actually bring people closer to God because we learn how to deal with the obstacles of life by relying on him and his word. Absolutely. 
why don't I ever hear you compliment my mustache? <laughs> All right. Eric says, what are your thoughts of the Deuteronomy 32.8 rendering in the Dead Sea Scroll? Deuteronomy, sons of God, verse, Masoretic text, variant, target, rendering, sons of Israel, Old Testament, use of Old Testament, reverse the divine. Okay. So the standard, and I don't mean necessarily by this the accurate, but the standard translation that most people are familiar with of Deuteronomy 13, or excuse me, 32 8, it says that God divided the nations according to the number of the sons of the children of Israel. And so on that reading, most people take it to be a reference to the 70 that went down into Egypt. And so proleptically, God's dividing the nations in view of the number of, of those that would that were going to go down into Egypt. And ultimately, from them, the nation would grow, and, and that would be the nation that was delivered by God initially, and then God would reclaim all the nations. But um, so that, that's the standard reading most people are familiar with. If you look at the English Standard Version, it actually says that God divided the nations according to the number of the sons of God. And that's because the Dead Sea Scrolls, the scroll on Deuteronomy, has gods there, son, sons of God, excuse me. Interestingly, the Septuagint translates 32.8 according to the number of the angels. Right, angels of God. So you've got these three possibilities now. Is it according to the number of the sons of Israel, according to the number of the sons of God, according to the number of uh, the angels? Well, one of the things you have to do when you're looking at textual variants is ask what, what, wording would give rise to the others right? right what would what would account for the others you know is it is it likely that they moved in this direction or that direction and one thing i can say is if you have sons of god there then it would account for either angels or israel because sons of god is sometimes used in the old testament to refer to angels right? Think Job 1, Job 2. So there's there's that possibility. If, if, a, if a Jewish person is coming along and translating this into Greek, he might render it angels instead of sons of God, thinking that that phrase bears that meaning there. But sons of God could also be a reference to the children of Israel. Israel itself as a nation is called God's son. All throughout the context of Deuteronomy 32, God is referred to as Israel's father, and they are referred to as his children. Over and over again, the text, in one way or another, talks about God as their father and Israel or Israelites as his sons. The term fathers used, sons used, begat you is used over and over again. And so the phrase sons of God could either be a reference to angels, it could be a reference to uh, the children of Israel. And so you... I would say the original reading is reflected in the Dead Sea Scrolls, but it doesn't mean that the traditional way of reading it, the sons of Israel, is wrong. It, it comes down to an interpretive question now. What does that phrase mean there? Does it mean sons of God in the sense of Job 1 and 2, or does it mean sons of God in the sense of the context where Israel is being portrayed as the, the that nation that God begat and so forth? Uh, so uh, that's what I would say as far as that goes. Uh, okay. So Corinth says, uh, my church doesn't do tithing and many other Protestant churches do not. I've even many of those who do so with pure motives. Okay. You guys must be talking to somebody else. Anthony has to get that Eastern Orthodox beard before his debate with, yeah, you know, I was thinking how ironic how ironic, you know, first of all, I debated, the last Muslim I debated was Osama Abdullah, who's been sporting a baby face for years now. He, he 
at one point was was trying to do the goatee thing but dropped that and uh anyways uh and then now i'm going to be debating seraphim and uh, he he's not last i knew wasn't sporting a beard so i'm gonna win the beard competition <laughs> Raymond says, wait until spring to shave your beard. Yeah. So what usually happens is when I get hot and it annoys me, that's when I shave it off. But Slam says, Israel is not even there back in the De Deuteronomy worldview. So that's why I said, Slam, that it would have been proleptic. Proleptic means, uh, you know, with a view toward. And so you, you'd have to, if you take the view that it's Israel, then you'd have to work out what relevant, why that would be the case. Why would God divide the nations in that way in light of the fact that 70 sons would go down into Egypt? You know, I, I wasn't trying to make a decision for anybody there, just, uh, you know, mentioning the options. I do think the uh, son of God, sons of God reading is the original and it accounts for where you get the others. Stupidity is amazing. Oh my. <laughs> I don't know why I wanted to show that one, but uh, I just did. Okay. Andy says, Anthony, what do you think about Paul making a sacrifice in the temple in Acts 21? How do you respond to people that say that means he was following the law? Well, I mean, it, first of all, by offering a sacrifice, he was following the law. That doesn't mean he thought it was obligatory. It's one thing to say that during the interim period between Christ's resurrection and the destruction of the temple, that certain things continued and saying that it was obligatory. Uh, think of the issue of like circumcision, for example. Uh, Paul had Timothy circumcised to take him into the temple with him, but he didn't do that with Titus, but he also didn't take Titus into the temple, did he? Uh, what Paul is, is doing is being all things to all men in order to speak to his countrymen, he's doing things that avoid causing them to stumble. If somebody said that Timothy had to be circumcised to be saved, Paul would have said, all bets are off. Timothy, you know, don't get circumcised. But in order not to raise the ire of Jews when he was bringing Timothy with him, he had him circumcised. You know, similarly, you know, Paul does things like offer a sacrifice shaved his head, made a vow, that sort of thing. Uh, it's not as if Paul couldn't do these things without, I mean, it's like uh, another example. Think of, uh, if you look at Paul's custom, it was to go into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. That doesn't mean those were distinctively Christian gatherings. All the Christian gatherings that are distinctively Christian that we see in the New Testament are all on the Lord's day. They're all on Sunday. Right, First Corinthians sixteen, Acts chapter twenty, Revelation one ten. It's the Lord's day, the first day of the week. But Paul would go to the synagogue on Saturday in order to witness to Jews. Where else is he going to find Jews? Especially when he goes into other cities outside of Israel, he's going to find them in synagogue, and he's not going to be able to walk in there with a bacon cheeseburger. So he's going to have to, you know, adopt certain things not because he thinks they're necessary, but because it is requisite as far as ministering to people the gospel. And so, you know, it's simply that Paul is avoiding creating a stumbling block. Paul didn't have problems with becoming all things to all men, but he would always draw the line when somebody like the Judaizers would come along and say, this is a condition necessary for justification or something like that. Uh, so Eric says, some try to connect angels of God in Deuteronomy to a divine council in Genesis 11, 7, which is why I asked. Genesis, oops, Genesis 7 seems to be 
or 11.7. It seems to be Trinitarian passage, though, not divine counsel. So one of my things about the divine counsel stuff has been not so much a denial of the fact that there is this retinue of, you know, higher beings, you know, that attend upon God and his throne and so forth, but people seeing it under every rock and that, that that's largely been, and then th there are certain things that I didn't like about theories that are being spun from it. Uh, but that's all a topic for another time. But it's it's not, I mean, you can see in in various texts, you know, you talk about the Lord on his throne, and then uh, he's surrounded by a uh, uh, host, you know, uh, and so forth. And so uh, there's, there's no question that there's a, a retinue of angels and other orders of beings that uh, are part of his court. But yeah, I, I just dis I disagree with seeing it under every rock and some ideas that people have run with in light of it. But that you know, uh, I do want to say though, since we've mentioned this, since the the main person that's known for advocating some of this is Michael Heiser, I don't know, I know if you guys have seen, but it looks like his health is seriously waning, and uh, his his days, per his own comment, are are coming towards an end. Uh, so. Do pray for him, pray for his family and others. Um, you know, I mean, uh, keep him in your prayers, him and his, him and his family. Uh, hey, Mr. Berean perspective. <laughs> I heard your message, but I, I didn't respond to it yet, but I will. I'm not ignoring you. I'm not ignoring you. All right, folks, uh, I think I'll call it a night. All right, the Tiger says, trust me, AR saw your comment, Harold Johnson. Which one? Which one? I did see several comments. Um, Harold says, North Riding of Yorkshire is where I'm from. Anthony doesn't have a British mid-brother. I'll leave it for another time, mate. Anthony doesn't have a British mid brother. Let me see. I'm, I'm missing something here. I might have to go back and read these. Where I'm asked, you don't ask. Oh, oh, so, okay. So Harriel was asking to be a mod. See, I was confused. I did see, I did see a comment about mod. But then I thought maybe I was, see, my problem is when I, the text goes so rapidly and people are talking to each other and all this, I don't know who's talking to me and who's not talking to me. Um, so I'll, I'll, uh, mod British mod. See, you're talking that British stuff. I don't know that British stuff. <laughs> all right. So I have seen your comment here. Y'all. Okay, so usually the way I do this is I usually ask my mods if somebody will make a good mod. <laughs> and I'm assuming you will make a good mod. Hold on, let me, let me see here. Oops. Um, all right, try and comment, Hariel. Let's see if you have been made a mod. All right. Thank you, Dinah. Thank you all. I do hope it was a blessing. Hopefully I'll be back on, on Sunday. If not, it will be soon, Lord willing. I already pretty much have everything planned for the next time. So, um, let's see, do I have time for this, Sam? Sam says, while reading 2 Samuel, I felt resemblance between David's sons and Jacob's sons, including Amnon and Reuben and Solomon and Judah. Am I thinking too much or is there anything in it? Uh, well, I wouldn't say that it's a bad potential intuition. I, I don't know in particular what you're thinking, so I can't really confirm it, but I, I would say that, you know, you 
there's often things that are, you know, that occur to you that are worth chasing down. So if, if there are certain connections that are suggested to you, I would, I would look into it further. I mean, I just can't say off the top without knowing more, uh, whether I've seen that or not or what have you, but, uh, the, you know, you get, there's, there's a reason for, you know, some people see things like if you look at, um, <laughs> slam says you have enough mods. Now you really want to be do modded. Um, if you, if you look at Genesis, sometimes, um, people are not i don't know what the right word is but uh well they, they think that it's it's a bit repetitious for example so if you read the account of eliezer going to get a bride for isaac it like repeats certain things over and over and over again throughout the story and so some people think that that's something problematic but there's something deliberate about that People also think that there's something problematic about the fact that you seem to see things happening in the life of Abraham, and then you're reading them in the life of Isaac, and you're like, wait a minute, that's the same thing I read in the life of Abraham. And so they think that there's something problematic here, right? Why, for example, does Abraham lie to Pharaoh and Isaac lie about, you know, his wife being a sister and all this? And, you know, what's going on here that all is deliberate there's something intentional there uh, when you have uh abraham uh, abraham is promised by god that he would be given the land that his descendants would inherit the land and then abraham asks for some confirmation that that god is going to do this and god gives him the the covenant of the the, the halves right he parts the animal has abraham part the animals and then causes Abraham to pass into a deep sleep, and then a smoking fire pot passes through the halved animals. What is that? Well, that's that's a foreshadowing of what was going to happen to his descendants. God was going to cleave the, the waters of the sea, and Israel was going to pass through with the Lord going before and behind them as a pillar of fire, right? All these things are significant. And so, you know, if you, if you see something like that, then... Uh, you know, look, look further into it. There, there may well be something there. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, I, well, I'm not going to demod slam, <laughs> but I, she said, you have enough. You can demod me. I wasn't sure if she was joking or not. <laughs> I assume she's joking because, um, because, you know, I mean, if, as a mod, I mean, they're, they're, it's not like anybody's obligated to show up. You know what I mean? None of my mods are like uh, obligated. It's and it's uh, I, I see. I've always said that, you know, I I go in people's channels, but I never try to become a mod because I don't want that responsibility. I've always been kind of like that. I, used, I worked at a Christian bookstore once and it was a good thing that I did this, but I had been there a long time and they always wanted me to have more and more responsibility. But one thing I didn't like, I didn't always like certain things that were done. I thought they were careless. And at one point they hired somebody that wasn't a believer. And I was like, what, you know, this is a Christian bookstore. Why are you hiring somebody that's not a believer? I mean, I'm not, I'm obviously not saying that unbelievers shouldn't have jobs or anything. I'm just saying that this is, I mean, how are they going to recommend these books and, and this sort of thing? You know, the person was very nice. Uh, I liked the person and everything had somebody to witness to during work, but I was like, you know, uh, this just doesn't seem like it makes a lot of sense to me. And they wanted me at one point to have the combination to the safe. And I was like, no, I don't want the combination to the safe. Well, nobody else knew that the manager knew that, uh, and so this person I was working with one time took money from the safe. And when they came back the and found money missing, the uh, manager, uh, you know, basically said it was this person. And they're like, how do you know it was me? And they're like, well, because he doesn't know the he doesn't know the combo. Right? <laughs> so uh, 
you know, I've always kind of shunned certain unnecessary uh, responsibilities and I'm not pretending like this is this huge responsibility or anything, but you know, I, I think it distracts personally. If I was in a channel and I was a mod, I'd feel like I have to do my duty and it'd be distracting trying to listen to the person. Um, but yeah, there, there's no obligation. Slam comes when slam comes. Slam goes out of town when she goes out of town. The other day, Slam was at a, uh, a pro-life rally. And so she couldn't be on. Anyways, uh, <laughs> Eric says, is that a New Living Trans Translation t-shirt, by the way, Anthony? No, this, this is a just a plain black t-shirt. <laughs> so I forget where I said it. Um, I was, I think it was in a debate with Osama Abdullah. And I said, I don't accept the new, new living translation. Uh, Cause he kept quoting it. And I, I wasn't saying that it's never any good or anything, but uh, I just, I, I just kept dismissing it. And I forgot that I was wearing a new living translation t-shirt. <laughs> They, they sent me a t-shirt or I got one. I mean, sent, I mean, they gave it to me at a conference I was at and I was wearing it at the time. Osama didn't catch it, but uh, somebody else did. <laughs> All right, folks. Um, I'm going to call it a night. Thank you all for being here. Pray it was a blessing. Look forward to being with you all again. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless.